Uh, today I get to fulfill a dream of mine, and that is to preach from down here instead of up there. Um, but I feel that since the church is a little bit emptier today, I have an excuse to come down here. Um, my name is uh, Nelson, and um, a lot of you know me, but for those who do not know me, this is actually my home church. I've just disappeared from here for like the past four months. <laughs> um, I've been uh, living life elsewhere, uh, but it's a privilege, a pleasure to be back with you here again, um, talking about the Word of God something that I truly enjoy doing. The title of our message this morning is Faith is the Victory. What's the title? Faith is the Victory. Today is a special event. Can anyone tell me what that special event is? What is it? It is the King's Coronation. Thank you. Today, King's Ch King Charles III will be crowned as king of the United Kingdom and all her realms. Where, where is this taking place? In London, specifically in Westminster. That's actually where I'm coming from. And when I told a friend of mine that I was gonna be in Edinburgh this weekend, they were like, why are you leaving? The king is getting crowned. Why are you leaving? You should be here. Uh, but I explained that I had to be here and I had more important things to do. Interestingly, the last coronation was 70 years ago. And the one before that was 86 years ago. And I have this feeling, however, that what it means to have a monarchy has changed since that time. For example, how do you feel that the king is getting crowned today? Does it change your life? Does it change your experience in any way? Let's turn our Bibles to Revelation 19, and we're going to see that as Christians, the matter of having a king is relevant to us. Let's turn our Bibles to Revelation 19, and we're going to read from verses 11 to 13. Revelation 19, verses 11 to 13. Let's read there. It says, Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was called, what? Faithful and true. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. Verse 13, he was clothed with a rope dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. In Revelation 19 from verse 11, we're introduced to an individual, and this individual has a couple of names. One of them is faithful and true, and the other one is the Word of God. Who is this individual? Revelation 1 verse 5 says, And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness. In Revelation 3 verse 14, Jesus speaking of himself says, These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness. Who then is the individual that's being described in Revelation 19? Who's the individual? It is Jesus Christ. Now let's jump to verse 16 in Revelation 19 now. And it says there, And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written. And what is that name? King of kings and Lord of lords. Jesus is king. And as Christians, we have an idea of what it's like to have a king in in 2023. Are we together? We should have an idea of what it means to have a king in 2023. 
But I want to ask the same question that I asked before regarding King Charles III. How do you feel about the fact that Jesus is king? Does it change your life in any way? Does it impact you differently? You serve King Jesus, I assume. You serve King Jesus. Is your life different from someone who serves King Charles III? Let's go back to Revelation 19. But this time I want us to focus on verse 13 and 14. Sorry, verse 12. In fact, let's read from verse 11 to 14 again. It says there, Now I saw heaven opened, and behold a white horse. And he who sat on him was called faithful, and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were what? Many crowns. On his head were what? Many crowns. I want you to keep that in mind. Today is the king's coronation. But on the head of Christ is what? Many crowns. Verse 14. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. The picture that we see here in Revelation 19 is similar to a picture that we see in history. When a Roman general or a Roman king would enter into Rome after a great victory, he would be at the head of the army dressed in special clothes. And he had a crown signaling his great victory. Now, as we look at Revelation 19, we see Jesus. And where is he? He's at the head of the heavenly armies. And what is on his head? Many crowns. And what do the crowns signalize? Victory. Not just one victory. Many victories. What do these victories represent? You know, sometimes I like to think God, I like to think of God or think of Christ through the mindset of a person. As human beings, we are very proud. And so, you know, when a Roman empire is entering Rome, he has this crown and he's just like, you know, look at me, look at what I have done. But God, Jesus is different. He is he is happy about things that do not concern himself. He is proud about things that do not concern him, himself. So I don't think that this picture of Christ coming with many crowns is, is him saying, look at me for what I have done for myself. I actually believe that these crowns represent the victory that God is hoping to have in your life and in my life. These crowns represent the victory that Jesus is aiming to achieve so that he can spend eternity with you and me. And so this crown, these many crowns, actually represent the victory that Jesus has gained or is hoping to gain in your life. I ask again, what does it mean to have Jesus as our king? It means victory. It means that we are winning. The church is very silent right now. It means that we win. It means that we have victory. Is this your experience this morning? Is Jesus gaining victories in your life? Pay attention to what I'm about to say. Because I could be misunderstood. It is possible for...
for someone who professes to be a Christian to suffer defeat the majority of the times. And with constant defeat comes discouragement and the temptation to give up. But do you know that continual defeat is enough to discourage just about anyone? There is nowhere in life where someone is continually suffering defeat and is like, yeah, I'm ready to, to, to go for this again. Continual defeat discourages anyone. The bravest soldier in the world would become faint-hearted if he had been defeated in every battle. But this morning, I want you to know that Jesus wants us to experience the joy of victory. He wants us in our Christian lives to experience joy and to experience the joy of victory. You know, it has been said that the soldiers of Alexander the Great were invincible. Why do you think people said this? Because they were as much human as the soldiers that they were fighting. But historians have said that these soldiers were invincible because they won with Alexandra every time. They won because of his leadership. They won because of his guidance. One of my favorite theologian writes and says, well, our captain is the Lord of hosts. He has met the chiefest foe of all and vanquished him single-handed. Those who follow him invariably go forth conquering and to conquer. Does anyone know what the word invariable, invariably means? Constantly. When we follow Christ, we can constantly be gaining victory. When we follow Christ, we can constantly win. I want us to turn to Galatians 2 verse 10. Turn with me to Galatians 2 verse 10. And we want to see something very important there. Galatians 2 verse 10. And it says there, sorry, Galatians 2 verse 20. My bad. And it says there, I have been what? Crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ does what? Lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Please don't misunderstand me. When I say that we can always be winning as Christians, I'm not meaning that you're going out and doing it by yourself. But Galatians 2 verse 20 explains that, that it is Christ living in us, gaining the victories. Here is the secret of strength. It is Christ, the King of kings, the one to whom all power in heaven and earth is given. He is the one who does the work. That's why the crown is on his head. To have Jesus as king today means that we have victory. Question, if Jesus is the one gaining the victory, is it boasting to say that we will always be winning? Is it boasting? It is. <laughs> But it is boasting in the Lord, and that is allowable. The psalmist says, my soul shall make her boast in the Lord always. 
And Paul says, God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. We are to boast not in what we are capable of doing, but in what Jesus is capable of doing. And I want to add something here before we move further. For us to truly recommend the Christian life to others, we have to know something about the joy of victory. I'm going to say that again. For us to recommend the Christian life to others, we have to know something about the joy of victory. Do you know that people around us are looking for victory? They are looking for victory over the things that are breaking down their families. They are looking for victory over the things that are breaking down their health. They are looking for victory over the unique problems and unique situations that they're facing in their lives. And Jesus, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, is the one who offers that victory. And we have the opportunity of sharing that with them. But unless I am experiencing the joy of victory, I cannot fully share the Christian message with other people. I remember there was a time, I think I, have made, I may have said this before. We were doing some evangelism in Edinburgh and we were handing out uh, leaflets. And I gave a leaflet to one of the individuals, and they said, you know, why, why should I take this? Why should I be a Christian? And you know, the right answer is to say, you know, that, you know, it will, you know, it will improve your life. It will make your life better. But the more the individual kept asking, the more I realized that I'm just giving a standard answer here. If I truly want to share this Christian message, I have to experience the joy of victory. I have to be like, look, I was in the same situation and I gained victory. We have to experience the joy of victory before we can share the message. I want us to get a little bit more practical I want to share, uh, I want to read for you this quotation, one of, one of my favorite quotations. I realize every time I preach, I say my favorite quotation. I have many favorite quotations. But um, actually, this may be like top five. Um, but I want to read it for you. It says here, through faith in Christ, it's for our messages to young people. It says, through faith in Christ, Every deficiency of character may be supplied. Every defilement cleansed. Every fault corrected. Every excellence developed. I want to read that again. Through faith in Christ, every deficiency of character may be supplied. Every defilement cleansed. Every fault corrected. Every excellence developed. I think I've admitted before here that I have a love for extreme statements. I love statements that are just so extreme and it's crazy. Through faith in Christ, how much can be done? Everything. Not some, but everything. You know, I went to university and to pass in university, you needed like 40%. 40% was enough just to, like, get you by. <laughs> and, I mean, if you get 60%, then it's like, you know, that's a B. Like, I did, I did well. And 90%, we're talking, like, now, like, high-flying. Everything is good. But God here is not saying that I want to get you to 90%. He's saying I want you to get to what? 100%. Every deficiency of character... That is, if you find something missing in your character, Jesus says, I will supply it. 
perhaps you find like me that, you know, your, your work ethic is a little bit shaky sometimes. Jesus is saying, I will supply it. Perhaps you lack self-control. You want to mind what you're eating, when you're eating it. Another struggle of mine. What does Jesus say? I will supply it. What does it mean when something has been defiled? What does that mean? When something is defiled, in a very literal sense. Polluted. It, it means something has been made dirty, right? You know, through life, we go through experiences that defile us. These may be mistakes that we have made for ourselves or even things that other people have done to us. But it says here that every defilement will be what? Cleansed. Not some, but every. And here's my favorite one now. Every excellence developed. You know, when, when we come to this topic of, of victory, personally, I often just think about the negative thing, right? I think about the things that I shouldn't be doing that I need to gain victory over. But it says here that every excellence is what? Developed. Meaning that God is like, there are some good things that I want to make even better. You know, as a chef, because I'm a chef, I aspire to be better. What can Jesus do? He can develop it. He can develop my skills and my abilities. And I'm very sad that Lucas isn't here as one of my favorite people in general. <laughs> and he plays the guitar very well, right? But what can Jesus do? Every excellence developed. Jesus can help him to do that even better. And the same is true for the doctors here, for the software engineers here, for the nurses. Whatever you're hoping to excel in, Jesus says that I can help you to do it better. This is what it means to have Jesus as our king. He is the one gaining victories in our lives. And as he gains those victories, it produces joy. You know, I realize that sometimes, sometimes, I am a sad, sulking Christian. I'm just talking about myself here. I'm not talking about anyone. I am a sad, sulking Christian because I do not know the joy of victory. You try, and you earnestly try to do the right thing. But a lot of the times I feel like I, I, I've had my equation wrong. I've thought that I am the one who should be responsible for doing something. And when I suffer defeat, what happens? Discouragement. But Jesus is saying, try again, but this time try with me. Because I am the one who gains victories. And I am the one who gives you the joy of victory. In closing, I want to go back to that quotation. And I, and I want us to talk about a very important part of the equation. The quotation says, through faith in Christ, every deficiency of character may be supplied. Every defilement cleansed, every fault corrected, every excellence developed. What do you think is the most important part in that quotation? What's the most important part? Yes. But there is, all these things hang on one thing. I'll read it again. What is it? Faith in Christ. It says, through faith in Christ, every deficiency of character may be supplied, every def defilement cleansed, every fault corrected, every excellence developed. The most important part is faith in Christ. 
Because that's where everything comes from. Are we together? So let us talk very briefly here about faith. What is faith? You know, I realized, I, I think I'd realized this before, but I realized this more yesterday. There's about a thousand definitions to what faith is. <laughs> there's so many de definitions. And there's not, I don't think there is any right or wrong answer, but it's a, I think it's about finding whatever clicks with your mind the most. And I'm going to share with you the, ex the example that, that has clicked with me um, the most. Let's turn our Bibles to Matthew chapter 8. And we'll start off by reading verses 5 to 8. Matthew 8, verses 5 to 8. And it says there, Now when Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him pleading with him, saying, Lord, my servant is lying at home, paralyzed, dreadfully tormented. And Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof. But only speak a word, and my servant will be healed. So this is a very common story. We have a centurion, and his servant is unwell. And so he goes to Christ in the hopes that Christ can do something for his servant. And then Christ says, sure, I will come and I will heal your servant. But he refuses. And he says in verse 7, verse 8, sorry, speak the word only, and my servant will be healed. I want us to focus on what Christ says in verse 10. In verse 10, this is what Jesus says. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to those who followed, Assuredly, I say to you, I have not found such great, what? Faith. Not even in Israel. Something about what the centurion says points out what faith is. Are we together? Because Jesus says, I have not found such, he, he doesn't even say such faith. He says such great faith. And so something of what the centurion said points out to us what faith is. I want to read for you verse 8 again, but this time I'm going to read it from the King James Version. It says here, the centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof, but speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. What did the centurion propose Jesus should do? Speak the word only. What did he depend on for the healing of his servant? The word only. Are we together? Are we together? He depended on the word to heal his servant. Here is what faith is. Faith is to depend on the word of God to do what it says it will do. Are we together? Speak the word only. It is confidence in the word to accomplish what the word itself says it will accomplish. You know, this is actually something, it's actually the first lesson on faith that the Bible teaches us. The first chapter we read in the Bible, God says what? Let there be light and there was light. Before he spoke, it was not. And when he spoke, it was. What achieved it? The word only. Faith is to have confidence that the word will achieve what the word has said. Now, in summary, 
Jesus is our king means victory. Because Jesus is able to gain victories in our lives. We are to depend in him to gain victories in our lives. But we are also to depend on the word to gain victories on our lives. You know, it sounds like I'm saying two different things here. Where do these two things come together? The point is, follow me here, Jesus gains the victory. Victory comes through depending in him. But his chosen method of working is through the word. I'm going to repeat that. Jesus gains the victory for us. We gain victory by depending on him. But his chosen method of working is through the word. Do you realize, or at least, it's a speculation, that God could have created the world in any other way? He could have asked the angels to, you know, get their hands down and mold everything. He could have chosen a different method. But he chose to create power through his word. And it is the same way he seeks to gain victory in our lives. It is through his word. By depending on the word, we are depending on Christ. It's just like he's giving us something to focus on. You know, if, if I am standing here and I'm saying that, you know, I, I believe that I can gain victory through Christ... And I just go about living my day. That's not how God imagines it should be. The word is supposed to, to give us a focus, a framework of what God is trying to do in our lives. And so, without the word, we cannot have victory it is as we depend on the word, it is as we depend on the word that we are depending on Christ to gain victory in our lives. I want to ask again, how is your Christian experience today? Is it dissatisfying, marked only with defeat? Are you ever tempted to give up in discouragement? I want you to know that Jesus wants you to experience the joy of victory. Today, Jesus, the King of Kings, wants to gain victory in your life. And he wants you to have the joy of victory. He wants you to win as you depend on him through his word. In fact, that's somewhere we can start today. You know, later on when you get home, express to God again that you want to experience victory and allow him to direct you somewhere in his word where you will be able to find a word specific for you that you can depend on, something that you can hold on to. And in closing, I hope that the words of Joshua 21, verse 45, will be true. Joshua 21, verse 45, which says, Not a word failed of any good thing which the Lord had spoken to the house of Israel. All came to pass. I pray that in your life, that not a word of victory that God has pronounced would fail in your life. Amen.